kid uh, every year at spring break. This always surprised me, like when I went to college, to find out that people actually went somewhere for spring break, like to a beach or something like that. Because during our spring break out at the ranch, every year we marked lambs. All the new lambs that had been born had to be marked and vaccinated and have their tails cut off and all that kind of stuff. And for some reason, it always had to happen during the two weeks that us kids were off for spring break. Didn't dawn on me until I got much older and found out that other people actually did things for spring break that my dad and my uncle, they actually scheduled it that way. That was just mean. So every new lamb that had been born, and we typically ran about 9,000 head of sheep on the ranch, and a lot of them had twins, so you've got 10, 12, 13,000 lambs that you have to mark. And the way we would do it is we'd put a little, we'd get these little metal uh, gate kind of things, these little metal panels that stood about this tall, and we would make kind of a small pen out of them, and then we would fill that pen up with ewes and lambs. And then you would go and you'd grab a lamb by the hind leg and you'd pull it over and you'd reach under it and you'd pick it up with its back up against you, and then you'd grab a leg and hold it like this and rest it on that fence. And the first person would either put a, a clip in the ear or they'd cut a notch in the ear. And then you'd slide down to the next person. They had a little, little nail that they would scratch the inside of the leg and they would dob some vaccine on it. And then you'd move on down to the next person who would cut off the tail or put a rubber band on there and, and do other things that, for the males, you know, to get rid of other male parts that you wanted. And then you'd go down and somebody else would drench it. And you'd go through this line carrying this lamp. Some of them were little bitty things, but some of them that were born early were actually pretty big. And when you got done at the ends, then you'd lay it on the other side of the fence and you'd go back and get another one. And you'd do this all day, lamb after lamb. And so by the end of the day, your clothes are just saturated with the oils that are in the wool. And all of the dirt and dust that's stirred up everywhere is just caked all over you. And all of the grass burrs and stickers and everything that were in the lambs are now all in your shirt and everything. And every once in a while, you'd pick up a lamb, and just as you'd get it up, well, it would just kind of do what lambs do sometimes. And so by the end of the day, you're just covered in all kinds of stinky stuff. And we smelled horrible. The only thing is none of us noticed it because we all smelled that way. Now, when we got home, Mom noticed it, of course. But you cannot mark lambs without getting absolutely filthy. It's going to get on you, right? Dory and I yesterday finished the last leg of our bike path, of the Hennepin Canal bike path. We rode 34 miles out and back yesterday. And by the way, uh, Pete and Connie rode it with us. You guys ought to congratulate them. They hadn't ridden as much as we have, but they made the whole thing with us. But one thing that I've noticed is Dory and I have been riding a lot. We've done a whole bunch this summer is when we got home yesterday, my legs from my knees down are just covered in dust and dirt and everything else. And I wear these sandals when I ride, and if you can see, they've got little openings in them. And when I took them off, there's just these stripe, dirt stripes all over my feet. I'm just covered in them. Well, you can't ride your bike in shorts without getting dirt everywhere because it throws up from the tires. There's things in this world that we do, you cannot do them without getting stuff on you. You and I, in our daily lives, get stuff on us. It just happens. There's nothing that we can do about it. Uh, just by going through life, we're going to get stuff on us. And I tell these stories uh, to illustrate some of this about the things that stick to us. It's inevitable that things will stick to us in life. Uh, not just physically dirty stuff, but things like bad attitudes will stick to us if we're around them long enough. Negativity will stick to us. Judgmentalism will stick to us. Immorality will stick to us. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, bad company corrupts good character. If we're around it long enough, it sticks to us. Anger will stick to us. Impatience will stick to us. And this kind of stuff is just around us almost all the time. And it does begin to stick. A lot of times there's nothing we can do about it. There's no way that we can remove ourselves from the world. We just go about our daily life, and at the end of the day, 
we've got this stuff all over us. The world around us just influences us in so many different ways that stuff sticks. And I'm not just talking about the stuff that's on TV and social media. I rant about that enough, and, and that is true. But there's other things that stick to us as well that we don't even realize. And as an example, uh, something that I realized a couple of weeks ago had stuck to me. See, I have Amazon Prime. Now, some of you know what that is. Some of you may not. I pay an annual fee to Amazon, and with that comes some different uh, benefits like the movies and stuff like that that you can watch. But one of the big things is free two-day shipping. I order something on Amazon, and by the way, it's almost dangerous because you can search on your phone and find it, and then you just swipe, and two days later it shows up on your door. It's the coolest thing. But what that has done to me is it's... It's programmed my mind to expect that anything I order is going to be there in two days. And so a couple of weeks ago, I ordered something, and I didn't order it on Amazon, but I ordered it online. Three days later, it wasn't there. And I got on my phone, and, and I went through the tracking thing. Well, it's stuck in Texas. It's in Fort Worth, Texas. And it's been there for two days. And I thought, well, this is ridiculous. So I sent an email to the company. I said, hey, what's up? I haven't got my package yet. I ordered it three days ago. And they wrote back and they said, it, it'll be there by Friday. Okay, that's two more days. Five days. And so Friday comes. And I check, and guess it didn't show up on Friday either. I had to wait six whole days for that package to get there just because there was a hurricane that messed up stuff in Texas. And, you know, that impatience has stuck to me. Because I've been programmed that when you order something, it ought to be there in two days. Those kind of things stick to us. They change our expectations, and that brings frustration, and it can cause us to get angry. And this is not how first fruits ought to be. That's not the way we ought to be if we love our neighbor as ourselves. And as I pointed out in the last two sermons, those are the things that are foremost for us as Christians. We are to be a kind of first fruits of all he created. We are to love our neighbor as ourselves. And James's letter is written to help the scattered dispersion do this in the world in which they live. When we look through James, there are three main topics that come up. One is perseverance. One is how we speak. And the other one is how we treat people. And these are all intertwined, and they're very important lessons for all of us in these times. And he began, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, speaking about perseverance, when he said, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because we know that the testing of our faith develops perseverance. That's one of the important things. And in our lesson this morning, he's going to speak about our tongue. I started this morning talking about all the stuff that gets on us throughout the day. And I want to ask, have any of you ever had one of those days where it just seems like more and more stuff just keeps piling up on you, piling up in your life? One thing after another, bad happens. And I know some of you may be, say, may be thinking, it's not just one day that's been like that. Lance, it's been like that since March. One thing after another just piles up on us, and before long, we've got all this pressure that's built up, and you know what? Most of the time, our pressure relief valve is our tongue. It's our mouth. We say things, and we just open up, and we blurt out, and all the anger and all the frustration and everything else that's just been piling up on us all throughout the day or all throughout the month just comes out. Well, James Chapter 1, verse 19 through 20 says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, and slow to speak, and slow to become angry because man's anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Quick to listen and slow to speak. Now, some people are good at this. Some people are not. We've been doing quite a, uh, some Zoom meetings uh, on Wednesday night, we have a Zoom Bible study going through the book of Genesis. On Sunday evenings at 6 o'clock, we have just kind of a life group. 
And by the way, any of you that would be interested in joining us for that, it's just kind of an informal get-together, visit with people that you don't get to visit face-to-face -face with. Uh, let me know after services. I'll send you the link to that. We do talk about some Bible-type stuff, but it's really just a great time to get together. But one thing we've learned in these Zoom meetings and any kind of computer interaction is you actually have, have to let the person finish speaking before you can start talking. You can't talk over each other on the computer because the computer then will just shut one person down. And so it's kind of made all of us have to actually listen to what someone has to say before we respond, which is a good thing. Now we just need to learn to process what people say a little better before we reply. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And this quick to listen... Is not mean, it doesn't just mean let them finish speaking, but it actually means to think about what they said. Because one of the things that happens to a lot of us is somebody will say something, but we don't take the time to listen and, and ask, I wonder what's behind that. I wonder if maybe this person is struggling with something. And what they said was kind of insensitive and hurt a little bit, but maybe, maybe there's pain behind that. Maybe they're going through something, and I ought to consider that before I just respond. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. And then he says, slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. And I understand this. Again, my patience gets tested in a lot of different things. And a few weeks ago, actually, it was the Tuesday before Dory and I left for Colorado. I had some stuff with a Terminator company, uh, Exterminator, a Terminator company, yeah. <laughs> I bought my own Terminator. I would be fine. Anyway, Exterminator company that needed to do something at, at the house for me. And back in May, I contacted them. I said, hey, I need you guys to come out and take care of this problem. And they never showed up. So I called them again. Actually, a guy came out to inspect something, and I told him about this problem. I said, see this over here? You need to fix this. And he said, I'll get that in our books, and we'll get out there. Nobody ever came. He showed up at my house again about a week later because the, the office had sent him to the wrong address. They sent him to my house again. I said, hey, this still hasn't been taken care of. He said, I'll get, I'll get on that. So that was back in May. So before Dory and I left for Colorado, I called him on Tuesday, and I said, hey, this still hasn't been done. And they said, you're on the schedule for Friday. I said, okay. And they said, he'll call you before he comes out there. So I spent all day Friday at home waiting for this guy. Okay? Dory has a hair appointment at 3.30. 3 o'clock she leaves the house and goes. I'm still there. 5 o'clock, nobody has shown up. And I'm not real happy about it. Dory gets back from her hair appointment, hands me a piece of paper, and it's a receipt that was in our mailbox at 3 o'clock when she left that was from this guy, said he had been there at 5 o'clock. And I said, how did he put that in your mailbox at 3 and say he was there at 5, and I was here at 5, and he wasn't here. Oh, I was, I was called in a good Christian way. I called their number at about 5.30. Of course, they're closed. And then we left that weekend. And so the whole time we're out in Colorado, in the back of my mind, it's like, I, I can't, I got to get back. I got to call these people. So as soon as we come back, I call them, and I laid out the story. And I'm trying everything. I, I'm trying to be nice. But have any of you ever struggled with trying to be nice when you're angry? No? Okay. All right. Okay. Some of you finally admit it. So I'm trying to be nice. And the lady on the phone, I, I go through the whole thing. And I said, first of all, I think you guys have a liar that works for you. Second of all, my job still hasn't been done. And she says, you're, I'll, I'll have a supervisor out there Friday morning. He'll be there between 8 and 11 on Friday. And I said, okay. 11.30. Nobody said. I called him. And by now, I'm really having to control my pressure relief valve. And I told him, I said, it's 11.30. I haven't heard from him. He's not here. And she said, well, just a second. Let me check on this. I could hear her typing. And she said, she said, Mr. Love, you were the third on his appointment list this morning, and he didn't make it to the first two either. And it shows here that we've tried the calling and he hasn't answered his call. Now then, something switched in me and I thought, I hope it wasn't an accident or something. 
And so finally I kind of calmed down and I said, I said, well, when somebody can, you guys get a hold of me and come out. Well, I got a call about noon from a guy. He said he was another supervisor, said he'd be there at four, and he showed up at five minutes till four. And I said, I said, yeah, I said, I got kind of frustrated because this has been going on for a while. And he said, yeah, he said, we finally found out that guy had a stroke. He had been in the hospital. And I said, well, is he okay? And she said, he said, yeah, he said he got out of ICU, but it's going to be a long road for him. See, the anger, man's anger, does not bring about the righteousness that God desires. My anger had kept me from loving my brother as myself. That it kept me from being a kind of first fruits of all that he created. We need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. In verse 21, James goes on and says, Therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. See, this moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, I believe, is all this stuff that sticks to us throughout the day. And the problem is, like when we were kids and working in the sheep pen, we didn't notice the smell of each other because we all smelled the same way. And I think the problem with us being the scattered dispersion that we are today is we don't even realize how much of it is stuck to us because we're just like everybody else that we are around. You see, back when I was a kid and we would do that work and stuff and you're all sweaty and stinky, you don't even notice it, but you get in, walk in the house and mom says, please, take those clothes off and go take a shower. If you're going on a date that night, you definitely shower two, three, four times, you know, and you use a lot of cologne and stuff because you don't want this sweet thing you're taking to the movie to think you stink. Well, when we come to church on a regular basis, and we're always surrounded, we're in the hub of, of Christianity, and we're surrounded by other Christian people, it's a reminder more frequently to get rid of all of the stuff that is stuck to us throughout the week. The problem is, now that we are scattered, we only come together once a week, we're not reminded as much. And sometimes we don't realize how much has stuck to us. And so James talks about we need to get rid of all of that and humbly accept the word that's planted in us which can save us. It's a conscious choice we make not to stay covered in that stuff, but to get rid of that and focus on something else. The word planted in us which can save us. And I think that ties back into verse 18. This says, He chose to give us new birth through, or give us birth through the word of truth. We might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. And we understand that this word is the gospel. It's the story of Jesus Christ and all that he's done for us. But I think this word also goes back to that loving our neighbor as ourselves. Because what James says next in verse 22 through 25 is he says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. This word that's planted in us which can save us is something we must do do. It's not just a knowledge that we have, but it's an action that we must take. And he says, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looked like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Not blessed uh, by what they do, but blessed in what they do. This word planted in us, which can save us, through which we have been given new birth, is something we need to do. We need to put this into practice. And I think it's something we all need to work on, especially in this time when we're not together as much. Years ago when I was working in youth ministry, a, a mother came up to me and she said, you know, she was really concerned because she didn't feel that her son was developing into the young godly man that she had expected him to. And she asked if there was something we could do about this. And I asked her, or I told her to think about how many hours each week he spent looking into the Word compared to the number of hours he spent each week 
surrounded by the moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. And I think when most of us think about that, those numbers are very lopsided, especially today when we don't have our Wednesday night Bible study, we don't have our Sunday morning Bible study, we're not having a Sunday evening worship service. It can get to the point where the number of hours we are surrounded by the moral filth and the evil is so much greater than the number of hours we spend accepting that word that's planted in us. And church, we need to change that. We need to consciously make sure that we are in that word and accepting it and doing it. And it needs to become our continual way of life. Notice that James says, looks intently into it and continues in it. It's in a part-time thing. It's not something that we just do on Sunday morning for an hour. This is something that becomes a continual part of our life. We must continue in it. Keeping And continuing in it means keeping a continual tight rein on our tongue. In verse 26, James goes on and he says, Therefore, or those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. You know, it, it's easy for us to come to church, come to church as often as we can. It's easy for us while we're here to do the right thing and think that we're being good Christians. But then we go off and the stuff that comes out of our mouth makes our religion worthless. It doesn't mean anything if we can't keep a tight rein on our tongue. And I know this is hard to do. You've probably noticed that I've used myself in most of the illustrations this morning. Because I struggle with this stuff. And when I decided, you know, hey, I'm going to start going through the book of James because I think there's some good lessons in there. I didn't say, you know, there's good lessons in there for Dave. Dave needs these lessons in there right now. Or Ken needs these lessons. No, Lance, I looked through it and I said, Lance needs these lessons right now. Because Lance is surrounded... I, I, I got to tell you, when I go over to take care of Dory's mom, we turn the TV on just to kind of stimulate her a little bit. I am just appalled at the junk, the moral filth, and the evil that is so prevalent on our TVs today. I'm watching a show the other day, this is not scripted here, but this is just something. I'm watching a show the other day, the Wendy Williams show. I'll just go ahead and say it. She was interviewing people. People in the audience would ask her questions, and this one lady said, I'm dating two men. I'm dating an older guy, and I'm dating a younger guy. And I just don't know if I really need to make a decision as to which one I want. The older guy's got money, and he's got stability, and he can treat me really well. The younger guy, he is hot, and the sex is awesome. And I don't know if I should give up one or the other. And the advice she got was, why would you do that? Keep both of them. You need that. And I'm just sitting there thinking, this stuff is just broadcast everywhere. And we're all stuck at home with nothing to watch but this moral filth that's so prevalent these days. And it gets stuck on us. And church, if we don't start getting rid of that and focusing on what God wants us to, and keeping a tight rein on our tongue. And I know the election's coming up. Man, doesn't that just open your mouth? We love it. But we shouldn't. It's time for us to keep a tight rein on our tongue. Because if we don't, our religion is worthless. James ends this section by pointing out that our religion is not based on what we say of ourselves or what we do by coming to church. He says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. In our first lesson in James, I talked about how James writes to those who are dispersed. They're not living in the hub of Christianity, where it's easy to stay faithful and clean talking about those that are living out in the wilderness. We're living in a time of out in the wilderness a lot. 
And I think these lessons are very important to us. It's not just about taking care of orphans and widows, though. We A lot of times we read this and we say, man, we're good. We take a collection and we send stuff to Schultz Lewis and we take care of those kids. I call widow ladies ever so often throughout the week to see if there's anything they need. And we think we're doing everything that God calls a religion that is pure and faultless. But we forget the last part of it, which is keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Church, we need to consider what's going in here. And we need to make some changes to keep ourselves from being polluted. So when we leave here this morning, we need to think about these things. We need to practice keeping that tight rein on our tongue. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. Slow to become angry. We need to practice religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless, taking care of orphans and widows in their need, but also keeping ourselves from being polluted by the world. Let's pray. Our Father, you speak to us words of truth to help us to live the righteous life that you call us to live. And Father, it's, it's a weird time where we're at home an awful lot. And we turn to the TV to distract us from the monotony of everything. We, we keep our TVs going with news and everything else. And Father, a lot of this stuff that's coming into our minds is not really good. And it generates anger and it generates frustration. And we speak and we say things we shouldn't and we allow things to stick on us that we shouldn't. And Father, this morning we want to ask your forgiveness. We want to ask you to open our hearts, change our mind, and let us truly be what we're supposed to be. Let us spend more time in your word. Let us spend more time talking about good and righteous things with one another, whether it be through phone calls, whether it be through Zoom meetings, whatever means possible, Father. Help us to stay clean. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Got a couple of songs that we're going to play this morning that again hopefully will, or the first one hopefully will help us empty ourselves and allow God to cover us, to make us what we're supposed to be. And then that, so the next song we're going to play is a song called Cover Me, and then we're going to do a song that's called the Communion Prayer to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper this morning. Again, if you're here this morning and you need prayer for some reason, uh, I'm not going to have you come up here, but you can stand up. Or if you need something, come see me afterwards and talk to me, and, and I'll help you in any way that I can. But if you need some prayers and want to stand up this morning, we'll notice, and uh, we'll be praying for you while Brandy plays this next song. <laughs>